Um, okay. Um, something completely different. In 2014, and there was a Venice Biennale curated by Rem Kohlhaas, and the topic of the Biennale was absorbing modernity. So the big question asked by the curator was, what did your country do during the last 100 years that's interesting? It, it was, of course, it was, it was a longer question. It was elaborated in a different way, but this was the, the, the sense of the question. So we have spent quite a lot of time with my friend Isa trying to figure out what was done in Poland that would be worth showing on the Biennale that was a competition for the Polish Pavilion. And we have spent like two months thinking about this and we couldn't find anything uh, because everything that we found interesting eventually appeared to be better in some other place. Uh, so one topic that we were thinking to present was women in architecture because they are amazing women architects from the 60s and 70s. Uh, but then we found out that in Soviet Russia there were more. Uh, we were thinking about the 20s, the 30s, but then in Germany, of course. So, And then we decided not to make the competition because, okay, everything was average. Uh, and after we decided that, I went for a trip with my Russian friends to Poland. Uh, and we went in a car. Uh, we passed through many countries on the way. We didn't go straight, straight away. And we passed the Polish border. And my photographer friend, 100 meters after the Polish border, started screaming and saying, like, stop the car, I have to photograph it. And he took this photo. So something snapped, and I was like, OK, let's figure out why do we even have Catholic churches built in the communist era? It doesn't fit. But I never actually saw anything weird about this. So. Um, we decided, well, we didn't make this competition at the end of the day, but we decided to figure out what, why were the churches built in Poland in the communist era. And we started uh, simply from uh, statistics, from counting them. I have to tell you one thing about the uh, methodology of the whole research, because it's important. We were both in Moscow, uh, and we didn't have access to Poland. We didn't go there much. So we started from statistics, simply counting and, and putting everything on the map. And, and then from, from the big scale, we went down to the smaller scale. I will show you this process. And a week ago, we came both to Poland and we started interviews with the architects. In the last week, we took uh, more than 12, I think 13 or 12. Uh, and we are going to do more. Um, but before, our research was more like urban, global, uh, less uh, architectural. Um, yeah, this is, this is one of the photos that was very important for us because this shows the whole thing. You have the sea of prefabricated uh, buildings, the prefabrication that was brought from Soviet Russia, uh, and it's more or less like everything that was built in the Eastern Bloc with small details and small differences. Uh, in Poland, the prefabrication came later. Uh, it came in 19... Well, it did come in 1950s in a very limited way, but the first factory of houses was built in 1971, and by 1980 there was already 144 uh, factories of houses. And almost in every, uh, like this micro rayon, or on the, in, almost in every neighborhood like this, you can find a dominating object, which is a church. Um, this, is, this is the map. Uh, the important thing about the map, there's 3,623 churches now. Uh, we have a crowdsourcing web page where people can add them. Uh, the important thing is that those churches were not built by the, by the state, and they were built either semi-legally or illegally, so they are not really in the archives. It's very difficult to find information about them, so we had to collect this information by ourselves. There is some information in the statistic uh, department of the Catholic Church, but they don't share it. Um, there is some information in the statistic department of Poland, but not really much. Uh, there were some uh, churches that were built completely illegally, especially in, in this part of Poland, uh, where f formerly there was a lot of uh, Ukrainians living here, and they were resettled uh, in the years 1945-1947 back to Ukraine. 
So there's, it's, it's, it's a little bit like wilderness. And uh, starting from 1970s, there were hundreds of churches built here in this kind of pi pirate way, just simply people going and building or taking over the former Ukrainian uh, churches. Um, <coughs> And what is also important about this map is that Poland is very strongly divided. You can always see it on the political maps, on voting maps. Uh, this is the sorry. Um, this is the this is coming from the from the division from the 19th century where Poland was partitioned between Germany, Austria. Well, not Germany, Prussia, Austria, and Russia. Uh, and it has two parts. The first part consists of the former, Rus former Russian partition and former Austrian partition. And these por two parts are uh, predominantly rural. And then there is another two parts. This is the former Prussian uh, partition here and the former German lands that were reclaimed after 1945. And this part is predominantly urban. Um, in here you can see, uh, it's an, can I get a normal microphone? Thank you. That's so much easier. Uh, so in here you can see um, you can see the. Can you hear me? Does it work? Yeah. Uh, you can see the graph, which is quite important. It shows how the churches were built. So on this axis you have time. In here is 1945, and in here is 2015. Uh, on the left side you have rural and on the right side you have urban churches. Um, and what's important is that there are two waves of construction. The first wave of construction is here uh, and this is 1956, uh, which in Hungary was tragic and in Poland was the opposite. It was the moment of freedom uh, or a thaw, a liberation. Uh, it's happened exactly, I think, uh, one week after the Hungarian, uh, uh, 1956, so it's more or less the same time. Uh, and the second one here is 1980, which is uh, Solidarity. Uh, this graph shows all of the churches built, um, and it shows that uh, every wave of construction or change of, the, of this graph is actually... Um, connected with some sort of um, political event. So if there was, for example, 1956 thaw in here, there is a wave of construction. If there was a 1970 massacre of uh, work workers where dozens of people died, uh, there is a start of construction. 1980 solidarity, there is an explosion. Uh, and the other important thing is that, no, two important things. First of all, in here, uh, the liberation was very short. The liberation of uh, the, the, the Catholic Church, it lasted for eight months. Uh, and eight months is enough to build a rural church, but it's not enough to build an urban church. Um, the second important thing is, uh, and sorry, and the, the important thing about, sorry, again, about this, about this moment is that in this uh, place, the architects tried to build the churches in the right way, to organize a competition using the union of architects, to talk about it, to discuss it, to choose the project, to start the whole procedure. And of course, it was not enough time. So in this moment, the society understood that you have to act really fast, uh, and you just have to start building without thinking about this. Um, and the second th important thing about this graph is that in here, uh, during the cosmic era, uh, between the flight of Gagarin and flight of Apollo 11, no churches are built. Uh, but what happens in this moment is the Second Vatican Council. And the Second Vatican Council, which changed liturgy in the Catholic Church, I will not go into details, but in general, what they did was liberalizing absolutely uh, architectural regime. They said, like, okay, starting from now, like, do what you feel you should do. Uh, these are the new liturgical um, uh, guidelines. Uh, but in general, there was huge mess after the Second Vatican Council. No, nobody really knew how to design, and the architects were a little bit on their own. Uh, so what happened? Uh, first of all, um, building a church in Poland was a predom predominantly political thing. Uh, the spatial decisions were not given by architects, uh, but by politicians, by uh, people who were responsible for, let's say, re religious policy in, this, in the country. And second of all, there were no guidelines from the Catholic Church. Uh, that means that 
it was a completely free field to, to, to build whatever uh, you wanted. Another thing that is, I will go very quickly through this and go back, go to the pictures, which are more interesting probably, uh, is that if you look at the line of construction of churches, this is the Second World War, so, and this is the Third Republic after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, it's almost a straight line, but it has this, you know, it stops, the, the, the construction stops here, almost like pushing with a finger, uh, where, where the communists are at the, at, at the rule, they were not allowing um, constru constructing a lot of churches. Uh, but in the moments when they were in, in trouble, the churches were built because the communists, they were like, okay, let's give the people an opportunity to build churches and they will not protest. Um, so this is how it worked. And we have also this Polish saying, jak trwoga to do Boga, which means uh, if you're in trouble, uh, pray to God. Um, and if you, this is the GDP growth of Poland. And you can see that at the moment when Poland take two decades of no GDP growth and like big uh, economic trouble, the churches were built. Um, you can also see on this graph, I'm sorry, this graph is under construction. I just got it two days ago and I, it doesn't look really good. But this is the, uh, this is all, um, this is like, Meet, um, not square meters, but cubic meters of all buildings built in Poland uh, from 1945. Uh, red is uh, housing, and the other colors, color is not housing, not, no housing, everything else. So you can see that the country actually did build a lot until 1980. Uh, so I wrote, communist still works. Uh, and then it started building a lot starting from, let's say, year 2000. And the moment when the country was in trouble and didn't really build and didn't really uh, kind of physically represent its presence in space, this is the time where the churches were built. The church simply became a sort of a uh, substitute of a country that didn't, uh, didn't really exist for the people. Um, and yeah, I will start showing photos from this one. This is a very important object. Uh, built in Nova Huta. Uh, Nova Huta is, uh, is, is very similar to the city that was shown yesterday, the Stalin city. Um, so it was a, a very important moment of uh, building a church in a perfect Stalinist city. And um, this shows actually, th this is a, one example that shows uh, actually the whole story. Uh, because it was allowed uh, to be built in 1956. Uh, the project was chosen in a competition. Uh, it was never built. Uh, so the people put the cross in the place where they wanted to build this. So the communists took the cross away. So an uprising started in the city. Many people were, Ill, were, were injured. The uh, police department was burned. A lot of cars were burned. And starting from this moment, there is this moment of, let's say, equilibrium that uh, the communists were scared or the government was scared to really demolish a church or not allow it, uh, but they didn't really allow, so it was like a gray zone and the people were using all possible, and also the architects were using all possible uh, ways uh, how to build this. So, okay, I will just show you a few examples. The biggest, uh, the biggest um, advantage of uh, this architecture is, is its diversity. Uh, all the buildings were built in a totally decentralized way uh, by the local communities. After the Second Vatican Council, the local parish becomes uh, uh, an important, uh, the most important um, cell of the of the of the community for the for the Catholic Church. It's not uh, the Pope anymore. That's like uh, that knows everything and doesn't err. And uh, he, it's it's the it's the local community. So the parish church becomes uh, like the most important um, cell. Uh, and the parish churches also finance, finance themselves, uh, find the materials themselves, decide on the project themselves. Uh, and there is a uh, curious situation where um, there's, the church is the only uh, architectural object for the architects. I'm, I'm citing, I'm quoting the architects right now uh, with whom we have spoken, where the architect has um, artistic freedom. They can build whatever 
stands. Um, they also don't have any prefabrication, um, but they also don't have any possibilities to use the uh, technology because it, all the technology is in the hands of the state. So they have to uh, do it spontaneously. And every the, the single uh, symbol, uh, every single church is different. We have photographed from Air 120 of them. Uh, I will show you a few a few photos only just to show show you the example of how it works and what is it. So this is the only only urban church that was built in 1956 after the thaw. Uh, they made it for somehow they made it, uh, and it was built in the city of Tychy, uh, which is one of the two uh, cities built entirely three cities built entirely from scratch um, after the war. Uh, it was meant to be a, a worker's city, but the workers, of course, they were <laughs> like very conservative villagers that were put to the city and they were like, where's the church? Um, this is uh, another another uh, church in, in Tychy. Um, this is uh, an interesting object because everybody loves it. The architects love it, the local community love it, uh, loves it, and the Catholic church loves it. The architects love it because of the because it looks like a spaceship. Uh, this is, I think this is exactly why the architects love architecture. If it looks like something from the outer space, the architects almost like it, always like it. Uh, the local people love it because they built it and it has uh, very beautiful uh, paintings inside. I don't have the photo from the inside. Uh, and the, the church loves it because the parishioners love it and it also has a brick interior. It, it actually satisfies everyone, which is, um, and this is another church in Tychy that is under construction right now. Um, this, is a, this is an interesting church in Wroclaw, uh, which is my city. Actually, I will go back to, very quickly to the, to the scheme I was showing you before. This one, I never told you what this is. Uh, so this is the amount of churches built in, um, in the divisions of Poland. So this is the Russian division, uh, former Russian division. This is the former uh, Prussian division. This is the Austrian, you can see predominantly the uh, rural churches. And this is the formerly German lands, uh, which were German until 1945, and then they became Polish. So you can see there was not a single church that was built until 1970, uh, because uh, there was no, like these lands were not legally Polish until 1970, and there was no uh, dioceses, di dioceses and parishes in 1970, only then, uh, they started building, so also this wave of construction moved from the 80s to the 90s, uh, so the architecture is different. Um, so this one is the first church built in Wroclaw after, uh, after the war, and it's very important because it's pro prototypical for the whole architecture. First of all, uh, it, is, it has double level, it's two levels of a church. Uh, why does it have two levels? Because there were so uh, there was such a small amount of permits give, given to the to the church to build that once they actually started building, uh, they decided uh, let's build it for two neighborhoods, not only for one. So they built a very high church, uh, and the lower level on the project was uh, just filled with sand that there was nothing on the project, but then when they started building, they just took out the sand and there was another level. And that happened in dozens of churches. This was simply the first one where it happened. Uh, so that later you have two levels, one level is for one neighborhood, the other level is for, for the other neighborhood. Um, and as I told you, the government was really afraid to demolish the church, so once it was done, it was done. Uh, the other important thing about this one is that this is uh, this typology. The architect who built it, Professor Tipser, uh, he calls this typology a church with a backpack. Uh, a church with a backpack. It's because it has a church, like double level church here, and it has uh, other functions here. The permit was given for one building only. Uh, so if it's one building, you have to fit everything there. So. A place where the where the priest uh, lives, uh, and what is also very important that after the Second Vatican Council, um, church was not only about the mass; it was also about culture. Uh, so it had to have cultural facilities. It had to have um, how do you call it? Like places where they teach religion, uh, like like school, whatever. Uh, 
cate catechization. I'm, I'm not really sure how it's called, but this is simply places where you have to teach religion. Uh, so they had to be in, in. So this is also a pr prototype where you have this backpack with all the other functions. Uh, and uh, this also causes why uh, these churches are really huge. Uh, many of them are like monumental structures. It has double levels and a backpack. Um, this is another church from Krakow where you can see the double level. So it has this kind of ramp from four sides. Uh, and in here the backpack is, well, it's a separate building, but probably on the permit it was written like one building. Uh, this, is a, this is a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic design because this is a little bit like modification of this double uh, level. Uh, when they started building this, and now I'm not joking, I talked about this with the architect, um, sorry. Uh, they decided that they will build a small copy of this church here. So you can see that this is exactly the same one, but it's like uh, scaled down. So that there is at least, like if they start construction and then the government stops it, so that at least there is a small church that's left. Uh, so they built this one and after, it, it's not a joke, it's like this. So, but it was, uh, the construction started in 1989. So they went to this level and then it appeared there is no communism anymore, so they can build a big, big one. So they left the small one in this state and they built the big one in this state. This is the funny story. Uh, a less funny story is that uh, I actually love this new function of Google that is you sh it shows you 3D. Um, the, very, uh, the, the idea of the architect was that it has to be a little bit like this Gothic cathedral of Wroclaw that is next to the river. Uh, and it has to stand next to the river and be surrounded with so small buildings. So the idea was that there will be a lot of small buildings with this religious, uh, religion t teaching classes and other functions, and everything will stand here. But after the, um, like in the end of it, it was still, it was 1987 where, where the um, economical reforms were done and there was still political, the, the political regime in Poland was still communist, but the economy was already capitalist, it appeared that the land does have an owner, uh, because before it was like, you know. Uh, so the owner of this land appeared to be railways, and they said, okay, you cannot do it. So they moved the church here and started construction here, and after the changes, also the Catholic Church uh, got a lot of political influence in the, in the government, uh, so they actually moved religion to schools so all these spaces uh, were not necessary anymore. So at the end of the day, instead of a, a complex of buildings at the river, we have one building far away from the river and the reminiscence of a small version of it. Um, this is a building I've been showing you before, uh, the one that is built in Nova Huta uh, in Krakow, uh, or next to Krakow. Uh, it's, uh, okay, I will talk about it later. I have better photos later, so please just enjoy the photo. Um, it was built in this, uh, in this uh, Stalinist city. Uh, why am I showing it? I'm showing it because since uh, building a church was not a spatial decision, it was a political decision, uh, all these churches are inserted into urban fab, all of them, or at least all of those that I have analyzed, which is major, vast majority. All of them are um, inserted into a urban fabric in a totally stupid, stupid way. Uh, they, are, they are not composed into the uh, design because the design was not, uh, it was never, it was never uh, to accommodate the church. The church was a foreign uh, alien uh, typology to, to, the, to the Soviet city or a communist city. So they are always in some weird spaces between buildings, uh, behind buildings, uh, and it's, it's, it's um, one of the uh, big challenges of our uh, project to actually analyze it and uh, make typologies and propose something. Um, this is another project in Krakow. Uh, this one was, it's also double level. It also has a cultural program. The interesting thing is that it has like a super rich cultural program because uh, the government of Krakow didn't want to allow this uh, to be built because it's too big and too many materials and church is not really that needed. They al always had this, uh, this uh, argument that there are things that are much more needed than, uh, um, than a church, uh, for example, a school and a cultural center. So 
in here the church decided they will build a church, a school and a cultural center together uh, in order to just simply destroy this argument and they did this. Um, this is, a, this is another church in the city of Katowice. Uh, it is placed on an, in the neighborhood which is called, uh, by, by, by the architects, it's called, not, not by the people who live there, the Polish Brasilia. Um, as you can see, this neighborhood is, uh, it is Polish Brasilia. It's, it's like the, probably the most awesome modernists, like all the modernists are going there and saying like, wow, this is so cool. But then, this was built by the same architects. Uh, the, the ones that, this is actually a pair of architects and they are both together called the Polish Niemeyer. Um, and uh, so, so, so the thing is that, 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 that both of them, they designed this, but then when they were asked to design the church for their own neighborhood, they designed, they designed, um, well, it doesn't work, they designed this. Uh, which is maybe it, it, it does have some reminiscence, but this is stylistically something completely different. Uh, this is another church in Chechowice Dziedzice, uh, made by an architect uh, who is called by the people who live there the Polish Gaudi. Uh, actually, this photo is not very good. Uh, the detail is amazing. I don't have um, close up photos of this one yet. I'm sending the photographer there soon, as, as soon as there are leaves on the trees. Um, but uh, the detailing of this church is so incredibly amazing. Uh, this is another one with no story. Uh, uh, on every photo you can see a red car. This is the car of my brother who was taking the photos. Um, the 1990 Mercedes. Um, no story. Yeah. Diversity, diversity, even more diversity, a higher one. Um, this is the first one, the one that I showed you on the first photo. Uh, this is a, a, a rural one. This is the biggest cupola in the world after Vatican. Um, it's built in the middle of the fields uh, and the construction started after 1990. Uh, I must say that majority of architects hate this one. Um, I love it, and it's not because of architecture. What is important about the churches, and this is a huge difference, uh, is that the church is built with no budgeting, with no uh, understanding of a budget and time. There's a different understanding of time. We start building and we build. So all these constructions I'm showing you, it's between one decade and three decades. This is the length of the construction. Um, and the financing of a church is different than the financing of any other building because it's not like you get a budget and you fit to the budget and you build it. In here it's every week there are people coming to a church and giving something to the basket and you take it and you buy some materials. It affects everything about architecture. It affects the materiality, the way of making the project, the way of building it, everything. And in here the money, for, this is like a huge thing. This is the only, like all of the photos as you could see were taken from the same angle. This is the only photo that we couldn't take from the angle because the building is too big. So all the, all the other photos we took from 100 meters and this one is taken from 250 meters. Um, and the, the way of building it was genius. It was, there was a myth created, the myth that the Catholic Church doesn't believe in. It was uh, one priest that decided that there was some sort of a miracle, uh, although the Catholic Church never said yes or no. Uh, they were like Pontius Pilate a little bit, you know, like not really uh, taking part in the discussion. And after creating the myth, he created a community about this, uh, around this myth. And after creating the community, he collected money. And he found a super efficient way of connect collecting money to build this in one decade. It was really fast. And probably the architectural style, this is uh, also a reason why people paid for it. Probably if it was brutalism, they would not. Um, but... <laughs> Just not to spoil the, uh, the, the, the humor, I'm going to show another church, which is a totally different thing. Uh, this one was built in the city of Świdnica uh, in the 80s. 
and the story was that the local parish, um, that there was an architect who built this neighborhood here. And the local parish asked him to build a church for the neighborhood. Uh, so he said, okay, let's make a competition between me and my son. And his son was 25. We will make two designs and you will choose what you like better. So his son decided that he will make this kind of spaceship um, design. And the local parish, which didn't want this kind of project to win, uh, they chose this one. Um, and it was built. The, I added this slide now because uh, this is the structure that uh, you were talking about uh, two, two lectures before, the shell structure. So I just had to add this, uh, this building to show you that we also have this. Uh, this building is called the White Batman. And, uh, and it's perfect. I, it's like, this is really what it is. Uh, and this is how the people from the local parish call it. Um, the important thing about all of these is that people love them because they built them. It's not an architect from somewhere that came to build it for them. They uh, participated in um, making the the competition, choosing the project, or maybe choosing an architect, and then constructing it. They were building, like the people were, uh, were, were building these buildings on the construction site. Uh, and now they are extremely proud of them. I will show you some close-up photos. These buildings are in an extremely good state. There is no problem of uh, kiosks being built or no problem of, of devastation because they mentally belong to the parish, which in Polish context means local community. This is how these uh, churches were built. Uh, this is a, a typical photo. I have uh, hundreds of photos from the construction site. Uh, the thing is, there, were, there was no machinery, there was no manpower, uh, so they were building scaffoldings. Uh, five minutes, okay. Uh, they were building scaffoldings, uh, they were uh, sometimes building even the small factories where you produce the brick. Uh, everything was made by the people. Uh, we have a lot of stories of how people were actually coming uh, and uh, building this. Um, the project is called Architecture of the Seventh Day. Uh, for the Polish Catholic people, uh, Seventh Day is Saturday because Monday is the first, uh, Sunday is the first day of the week. Uh, Stalin decided uh, that uh, Monday will be the first day of the week, so there is always this confusion which one is the first or the seventh. Uh, but we called the project Architecture of the Seventh Day because majority of construction took uh, place on Saturdays. In the moment when the communist government introduced Saturday as a free day, a lot of people were able to come and uh, enjoy their leisure, which was building churches. Uh, this, is a typical, uh, this is a typical photo from the construction. It's, this is the 80s. And now, uh, this is an example I really like because it shows uh, the role of the architect and this is also showing uh, what our publication will be about. Our publication will not be about history, but it will be about um, what can we use it for in the future. Uh, and we think that Poland became a laboratory of uh, communal architecture or I don't know how to call it yet, maybe communal is not a good, but working with people. So an architect in this kind of construction became a manager of talent in his parish, which means in his community. In here, uh, the design was made by an architect that was 30 at this time, so he was extremely influenced by Japanese postmodernism. Uh, but the construction was executed by the uh, masons, mason masters that were more than 80, because in the 80s they remembered the art of masonry from before the war. So he was designing this kind of, sorry, he was designing this kind of uh, architecture, but they were able to create this kind of detail like this Rosetta, uh, or like detailing of this church is absolutely amazing. Uh, until today, there is not a, bu a single building in Wrocław that has this level of uh, manufacturing the detail. Uh, this is another example. It doesn't look good probably from, it looks better on the screen, but I will tell you what is here. Uh, this facade is all made of stones that are of this size, of uh, size of a fist. Uh, and all these stones were brought to the church by the parishioners from vacation at the sea. Uh, the church is 700 kilometers from the sea. Uh, so people actually brought all this material, uh, like these small round churches, to clad all the facade, uh, and all the facade was cladded. 
And the most uh, interesting thing about the stones in this church is that even the Pope uh, actually chipped in. Uh, the Pope was given, not the, not the Pope John, John Paul II, the previous Pope, uh, he was uh, given as a present uh, a stone from the moon by Apollo 11 crew. Uh, and he gave this stone from the moon to this parish and they also put this into this church. Uh, so there is quite a collection of stones in here. Um, this is, uh, I, I also decided to add this, uh, uh, to add this picture uh, yesterday. Um, Olya was uh, talking yesterday about these amazing architects from Warsaw from 1950s and I have this hypothesis working with this project that there is nothing that happened in Poland since World War II that was not connected with church building. Uh, so I asked uh, Olya after the lecture and it appeared that those architects also made a design of the church that was very much influenced by the um, Corbusian ideas. So this is it. Um, yeah, and what we are doing now is uh, simply interviewing architects. There's still 56 architects alive that uh, build the churches, so they are mostly alive. And uh, we want to interview at least half of them. We are asking them exactly about how it was built and how it was managed. And we are planning to make a public. We also made this uh, crowdsourcing web page where everybody can give their uh, own. So you can choose your chur church that you were building and you can add a memory from building this. And people are actually uh, sending us memories and we are uh, collecting, we are trying to analyze them and uh, make sense out of this. Um, yeah, that's it actually. So uh, on the tw 24th of, of November we are going to publish the publication in Polish and then later probably in other languages if we get funding. Uh, but as I said, now the work is in process and the most important thing is that we don't want to really tell the story of the past but think uh, how useful it may be all this, all this um, all this experience because the Polish architects actually had this uh, privilege of working in extreme conditions with local communities uh, and they are still alive and they know how to do that. Thank you. Thank I will leave the white Batman here. Thank you very much for this extremely interesting uh, presentation. Uh, at the, in, in the 80s in Hungary, we called second culture the, the culture which was not the mainstream culture, just, just down to tattoos and, and everything, but we didn't think that church building can be a second culture. Uh, so it was very interesting for me. Uh, do we have questions? Yeah, Kuba, thank you very much. It was really extremely interesting, especially that is so phenomenal and that you, you are lucky that you choose such a topic which is un, uh, unresearched already. So congratulations and I hope the publication is going to be soon. Uh, my question is about the architects themselves, that if they was asked to do such a, uh, such a design, if they had no problems with the actually with communists or with the regime because they was somewhere in the in the work in some institution in some projection company just in Czechoslovakia this would be a big problem or that time of course in 70s 80s um, I will use a quotation from our Nobel Prize winning president Lech Wałęsa who was a leader of the solidarity movement during one of his lectures in Japan he said that the Polish communists were like shrimps they had a very thin layer of red outside, but inside they were white. Uh, and I think that this, this uh, quotation actually describes it, because I was asking this question to every single architect, and it appears that at the end of the day, this is a very conservative Catholic uh, society with a few communists on the top. But then uh, the guy who is giving a permit is not Brezhnev, right? He is a guy who is living in a small town and he is like, he has friends, he wants to go to heaven, uh, he is afraid of the priest. So it was always, like there are hundreds of stories and they are always like this. Yeah, so I went to this guy who is a, 
who is uh, who was the director of the nail factory and he told me I'm not giving you any nails but then he called me and said can you send um, an ambulance to the factory because we have uh, an accident so he sent an ambulance and the ambulance came to the to the church with nails uh, and it's 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 like every single person is telling this uh, so I think it's uh, it's a little bit like with these Lithuanian churches, I think, that uh, the people were strongly like believing in God and they wanted to go to the church, they needed this. So they built themselves uh, something different, but it was a church actually. Uh, and in here it was the same, like everybody, you know, the, the white Batman was built because, um, this one for sure I know, because the main secretary of the city of Kalish was a um, let's say strongly believe in Catholic and he, w he w didn't want to have problems after, after he dies. And this was his, like, okay, yeah, just build it. Build it. Could you explain some uh, words again? Uh, is there any difference that you, you described the, the Ukrainian part, the probably German part, the Austrian part? Uh, what does it mean for the Architecture or for the for the for the process of uh, uh, of inaugurating such uh, architecture, uh, or it, is there no difference? Uh, or, uh, it only depends on the number of churches. There is a huge a huge difference. Uh, the biggest difference is that um, I'd say the most urban part of Poland is this, right? You can see it with churches also, rather urban churches, uh, and majority of good architecture is here. Uh, it's simply the place where the architects, until today, uh, where they are much better um, educated, they have much more material. Also, uh, since what is important is that all the material was stolen, uh, all of it. So, for example, in here you have a nuclear power plant that was never built, but the church was built of the nuclear power plant cement. Right? So all the material was stolen, uh, or it was produced, or it was, there is this Polish word that means fix something, arrange something. So it was, you know, in a sneaky way it was arranged, which means also that it was stolen from the, from the country. Now, the people didn't see it that way in, in these times, because uh, in the communist times everything was common, so they didn't understand this as stealing, or it was rather like, you know, helping to build a church. It's not a sin to, to, this is one of the quotes also from the priest, it's not a sin to steal for the church construction. Um, and the differences in architecture. In here you have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, takeovers. Uh, and in here there was a bishop who was very well known to the communists uh, for being extremely radical. He was like radically anti-communist anti and he was, even the Vatican wanted to take him away at some point, but even the Vatican couldn't. Uh, and he said in the beginning of the 70s, if we cannot build the churches, we will just build them illegally. So there is a lot of stories here. I think the most romantic story is about uh, building the church in the corn. And there was a cornfield, corn field, corn grows four meters high, so they were building uh, whatever they could in the corn until you can see it, uh, and the other elements were built in the barns and they were like prefabricated elsewhere, and then during the night people brought them and built them. So architecturally it is not uh, astonishing, uh, it is an ugly building, but uh, the stories behind them are, are really cool. In here, in the formerly German lands, uh, it was from the very beginning, the church was treated in a different way. Uh, because in here, the communists, especially in the Stalinist times, they were treating the church as, a, as an enemy. Uh, and in here, they were treating the church as an ally uh, to make the German lands more Polish. Uh, so it was a different, different way of treating the church. Also architecture, it's more, um, it's more gothic, uh, it's, it's, it's more symbolic, uh, red, red brick, yeah, simply. Um, yeah, and the, the, the other thing that is very important, the more industrial area, the bigger spans, because you can still be, uh, s steal bigger elements, simply. So like steel and then, and, and. in here we have a, I don't have a photo in this presentation, but somewhere here, there was a Soviet uh, army base in Legnica, 
who was the biggest Soviet army base? It was uh, it was here, right on the on the German border. The idea was to attack the the, the, the NATO as fast as possible, uh, and they left in uh, in 1991. But already in the 80s, when the Soviet Union was uh, dissolving and falling apart, uh, it was uh, this 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 territory that the army was de demoralized. So. In the 80s, still before the fall of the Soviet Union, we have a church that is built. Uh, it has the whole construction of the Soviet hangar uh, for the for the MiGs, uh, and it was taken 60 kilometers from the from the military base. So the the, the scale of action is impressive. Is it? Is <laughs> If you, when I was, went to Villanov in Warsaw, I saw what such of a project, but no, now there are no more communists, but the, the, the process seems the same. We, we start and then wait if the money comes the next 10 years and then we will look, look forward or what? The one in Villanov is an exception. Uh, it's an exception because it's not a parish church. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, the same story is a little bit with, uh, sorry, where is it? Uh, with this one, it's also not a parish church. This is the, it's called the Millennium Church. It was built for the Millennium of Poland to, the idea was to build a Polish church in the German city as a act of, but it's not a parish church. It doesn't have a parish around it. And the same in, in, in Vilanov. Uh, this is the church that was, uh, its construction started in 1792. Uh, in 1792, uh, Poland had, uh, its constitution written, which was the second constitution in the world. Um, and I think it's quite kind of funny, but uh, the rational uh, enlightenment uh, constitution, in, the, in, this, in this rational constitution of the age of enlightenment, it was written that the Polish people are going to build a church to thank the God for the constitution. So I think the Polish people didn't really get the enlightenment, very, you know. Um, so in 1795, Poland ceased to exist. So the construction started, uh, but it didn't. Fin it was just a foundation that they built. Uh, after the First World War, where Poland started to uh, gain independence and, and started to, uh, to exist again, they decided to build it again. Uh, and again, they made a competition. They found a place. They started. Uh, they didn't, didn't even start the construction because the Second World War started. So after the Second World War, uh, in the communist time it was impossible to build this. Uh, but already in the 80s there were ideas uh, to build this, um, this church uh, to thank for the constitution. Uh, and finally, it was realized uh, in Warsaw in, 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 the, in the 90s. The design is awful. Um, it's, it's awful, it's really awful, but the important thing is that there was a competition and the, in the competition uh, the design that took the first place is absolutely amazing. Uh, and then there was some sort of a, you know, changing, like choosing someone else, not really ch choosing the, the, the competition uh, project and then they built what they built. Thank you, thank you Kuba for this. Um collection, let's say. It was uh, amazing and I'm a, I'm a bit confused. Um, all of these churches are um, experimental works in a way. Um, and could you, could, could you tell us uh, another field uh, of architecture or another function um, where Polish architects uh, of, of this period um, made uh, uh, also experimental works which you can compare with shells. these churches? Shells. Sorry? Shells. shells. No, not just shells. Look, throughout the whole period of communism there was a lot of good architects working. Uh, and we, we had one example yesterday of a really amazing work. Um, but I have a feeling, and I have this. Fe this feeling is even even stronger after uh, after this uh, conference. That uh, there were limits of the framework of the socialist country, and 
I think the Lithuanian architects, they, they came to these limits very close and they were trying to do something different. Uh, but in architecture that was uh, residential, uh, industrial, um, I don't know, commercial, although commercial is maybe not a good word, uh, administrative, there were very stri st uh, strong limits. Uh, and probably the best that the architects could do in these times was uh, ins being inspired by the West. Uh, and, and a lot of this happened as well. And I chose to work with this topic because this is out of this world, you know? This is architecture that is completely different. Uh, especially you can see how different it is in this context. You know, like this that you have on the top, you know from Hungary probably, uh, and probably you know it from East Germany. Definitely you know it from Russia. Uh, this is like Brezhnev, right? Like a carpet building of, of like produ producing space that is not really uh, of high quality. Uh, and this is something from a completely different order. Uh, and I think that uh, this was the most interesting what happened in Polish architecture uh, en masse. Thank you, Kuba, for the presentation. And I would like to ask the question about the um, uh, discussion in wider public in Poland uh, about the modern or uh, the architecture of uh, uh, the socialist regime. Um, you mentioned that the people, because they were participating on the building, on construction, they uh, have relation to the, the, such a building and so they accept also the modern appearance of the architecture. Do you see, or if in our research, we were researching sport, leisure um, areas, and also there were voluntary workers that they, they had to participate as well. And for example, in some kind of public discussion, uh, if this uh, su su such a structure should be demolished or destroyed, this is very strong uh, voice that people, they, they really feel uh, or they identify themselves with, uh, with, with the area. So they help us, art historians, in a, a wider um, public discussion. So do you see any connection um, in, uh, in discussion in Poland that the people, they accept um, modern or uh, the, the architecture that was um, built during the second half of the 20th century thanks to this that they are how to say that they they accept uh, as uh, already some kind of modern appearance so do you think there is any connection or is is your project is the aim of your project maybe uh, uh, also to contribute to this discussion that uh, there is some kind of acceptance already? First of all, you can't demolish the church. That's the thing. If you do this, you are a heretic, you are a Bolshevik, you just don't do that, especially in Poland. So I'm in a better position than people that are interested in modernists because people simply don't demolish churches and they will, never will. That's it. Um, and answering your question, um, there is a contradiction. First of all, people don't like modern architecture in general. This is my opinion. And I think it's not only in Poland, I think it's everywhere. Maybe there are small exceptions like center of Copenhagen, uh, where people do like modern architecture, or center of Helsinki. But those that live in the outskirts, they don't anymore. Um, but the people here, although they don't like modern architecture and they think that the church should be classical, they would never do harm to the church that they built. So it's like the not in my backyard uh, attitude, but inverted, right? It's like in my backyard, yes, uh, but in the others, no. So um, what I'm really astonished by how bad the reputation of this architecture is. There is this, oh, I didn't show the photo, there is this extremely cool Facebook page that's called Chicken Churches, where they actually use paintbrush to draw eyes and peaks of chickens to these. Uh, and people just throw in hundreds of uh, images. So on the other, on one hand, the, the, the reputation of this architecture is bad, but on the other hand, the state in which they are is extremely good because this is a community center. 
this is a center, this is a heart of the community, and the people build this, uh, and they feel uh, attached to it, and they, it's their church, that's it. You have mentioned this uh, second culture. Uh, in the recent research of this socialist legacy, uh, some researchers uh, in Lithuania have used this network society or invisible society also. But uh, my question is related to what has uh, been said before. So how such a traditional society accepted from the very beginning uh, each church was very strongly strange, original, unique from the modernist point of view, even avant-garde, I would say. Was I, it a professional suggestion or? I have a, I have a, I have a hypothesis. Uh, I was also wondering how, is it, how was it possible in the 80s, and also I don't know how it was in Hungary, but in Poland the 80s was like the worst possible period. So there was like nothing. Uh, there was martial law, there were tanks on the streets, there was uh, strikes, uh, there was nothing in the shops. It was like the worst period. In, in Russia, for example, the worst period is the 90s, economically. In Poland, it was the, it was the 80s for sure. Uh, and how was it possible that the people build this? And I have a hypothesis after one of the discussions with, um, with the architects. Um, there is one authority in Poland, and this is John Paul II, uh, the Pope. This is probably like the only authority that everybody accepts as an authority, uh, because he was trying to make. Uh, first of all, he was a communist pope, like pope from the communist country, so it was, uh, let's say, paradoxical. And second of all, he was uh, probably a good pope. Um, and this architect told me uh, that he was in favor of modern architecture. So he said he was discussing with architecture with him for over an hour with one when he was already a pope uh, for, for about I will show you which one they were discussing no this design right uh, so excuse me. Yeah, Rom Romuald Legler exactly, and he he was he was t telling me that the pope simply thought. Uh, that the church, although it has a very long history, it, look, it should look forward. Uh, it should be about the youth, it should be about the young generation, and he was forcing himself uh, these, uh, in, many, in many cases, he was forcing himself um, uh, these designs. We were trying very hard not to talk about religion and, and the Pope uh, in this research, because it's a very difficult topic, like you can step somewhere and then you just explode because it's not a good, you know, it's, there's a mind there. People get offended very often if you talk about religion. But still, I think that we are going to include this, uh, this, this, this uh, figure of John Paul II because uh, he was, he is always on the photos. Like there is a photo of, of the architectural model and he's just looking, you know, like inside. Uh, then there is an opening, he's also there and like looking at the construction. So I think that uh, being an intellectual, being a poet, being a writer, he was also, he had this thing for architecture. Um, and as Ron Walt Legler told me, uh, it was, uh, it was strictly a, a direct, let's say, order of the, of the Pope to, to, to choose the designs that were contemporary. But this is just hypothesis based on one conversation. It was very interesting what you said about the Polish architecture, that uh, they can uh, um, uh, work very good together with the um, people. Uh, because I think in Hungary we don't have such a tradition and sometimes it can make problems. And I would like to ask what is your opinion? Is it um, um, knowledge uh, for this generation or it's built in the architectural education already and it will uh, live longer um, in the future too? I think, first of all, it's the attitude, because the Polish people don't like the government, whatever the government is. Uh, and it's just like this. Like, now the government that we have, that is a copy, a Xerox copy of Orban, um, 
people chose them because they hated the government, and once it was chosen, people hate this government. So uh, there is a, this is probably a historical thing. The Polish people have this attitude of uh, rather um, trusting your family and your parish and your priest than trusting the government. Uh, I think that the, in my opinion, my ed architectural education that I had in Poland was everything about everything except of community working. It was just about individual projects. Uh, but this generation was simply forced to work in this kind of um, situation. I'm romanticizing a little bit. It's not like, you know, I'm telling it's a labor laboratory of bottom-up architecture. It sounds so good. But this is a way of, you know, of building a narrative. Uh, the reality is that um, these churches were built with whatever was there, uh, whatever forces were there, uh, whatever, I don't know, possibilities were there, and the architects were forced to become uh, managers of the community, uh, rather than they chose to do that. And it also finished in 1989, right? It's like, after, after the changes, uh, the churches are built exactly like other buildings. You just collect the money, pay the firm, the fir firm comes and builds it. It was the, in the communist times that it was built like this, and maybe in the first years of the 1990s. That's important, sorry. I, I was about to say that, and I didn't. Um, I have a, sorry, I have a question about the, so these churches are all very, very big, <laughs> and uh, were there really so many uh, religious people who needed these size buildings. I mean, I suppose Poland was always a Catholic country and there should be a lot of old churches as well. So I'm, I don't know if, if you understand what I mean. Or they just wanted to show that uh, they are against the system and that's why they chose this size. Uh, were these churches really full of people? and? So, first of all, uh, Poland was destroyed during the Second World War, entirely. Uh, it was destroyed in such a scale uh, that is not comparable with anything except for the European part of Russia and Belarus. It, it was, some cities were, were, were uh, torn down entirely, like Warsaw, 95% of destruction, nothing was, uh, was there. Uh, Wroclaw also, more than 90%, uh, Gdańsk, so the biggest cities were simply leveled. This is the first thing. The second thing is that Poland, after the Second World War, was a rural country. It was a rural country, especially in the former Austrian and Russian division. So what happened is that in the 50s and in the 60s, in the Stalinist uh, five-year plan, in this the this, this so-called Stalinist accelerated industrialization happened. So a lot of a lot of uh, neighborhoods were built, new cities were built. The, in the, the the urbanization in the east, in the west of Poland, which was let's say under the Prussian and German um, uh, rule, uh, it happened uh, in the Gründerzeit, right after the 1871, and in the east of Poland it happened after the Second World War. So there were new neighborhoods built with no church, of course. This is the second thing. The third thing is that uh, the permits were given, there were very little, like, until the 80s, it was like, you know, one permit in a city. So once, once there was a permit, they were like, okay, let's build big because everybody is going to come here, right? Uh, so they were building as big as possible. There is the city Jastrzębie, uh, which is also a new city built from scratch uh, in the 60s. A very beautiful one. Uh, I think the fans of modernism will, would like it, uh, very much like the one that you were presenting about. Uh, and the church there is enormous. Uh, and now, of course, and in the 80s, they were like, okay, now we, know, we, we can do this. Uh, there is more permits, so let's build more. But the ones that were built before, they stayed. And this is also, we also uh, actually uh, calculated the cubature of all of these churches. We have them in, in, in our database. Um, and the other thing that happened is that uh, the heating price uh, is much, low, uh, much higher now, right? So you were building a church for a parish for 30,000 people. Now there's 3,000 people, uh, so 10 times less. 
the costs of heating it are like 20 times higher and you have a like, huge amount of air to heat. So we also have a map of these uh, churches that are problematic. Uh, and of course, as I told you before, the financing is still the same. The people come to the church and put something to the, to the basket, and then the church uses it for, uh, for heating. So I think there is a crisis coming. <laughs>